Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 and 2 that says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So, some of the most fundamental questions that human beings have asked throughout the millennia, throughout the world, are questions like, who are we? And how did we come to be? When did we come to be? Why are we here? What is our purpose in life? They make movies about it. They make books about this. People wonder this all the time. Every generation has these questions embedded in their minds. And then throughout the ages, in a great number of people, whether they're philosophers or scientists, theologians, they all have tried to provide answers to these questions. And, and what I want you to know is that these answers that they have provided, they are all influenced by each individual's presuppositions. All of us, without exception, you and I and everybody we know, we, are, we have all developed certain presuppositions from our background, our education, our environment, and our experiences. It is inevitable. So these presuppositions that we all have determine ultimately how we live our lives. They determine our opinions about life, our opinions about family, about friends, or education, politics, morality, ethics, you name it. Everything. They shape our opinions about everything. So, one aspect um, that, that needs to be um, emphasized here is that our presuppositions also determine our worldview. Uh, and unfortunately, we live in a time and a place where there's a great number of people that presuppose that God does not exist. Things that happened in the past are either the result of random and fortuitous events, or they are the result of human intervention. Those are the questions that we're dealing with, the presupposition that there is no God. And, and as for the future of this world and our lives, well, it is all up to humanity to determine what is going to happen in the future. So it's, it's very self-centered, it's very humanist, hu human-centered. So let me give you some examples of how this actually looks like. From our, enter in, in our entertainment industry, uh, we see that it has been suggested that the Earth is the product of super technologically advanced uh, aliens that came to this planet long time ago and then just planted these seeds of life and then everything came to be. It has also been suggested that the end of the world is always near, whether it is going to be through uh, a massive asteroid that is in, in collision course uh, toward the Earth, or it's uh, a war, or a natural or biological disaster, the zombie apocalypse, I mean, you name it. There's all sorts of dangers that we're facing all the time, and we're always on the brink of destruction. And in every case, it is entirely up to us, humanity, to save the planet and our civilization with it. And, and, and as I'm telling you this, and, and, and as I'm, these words are coming out of my mouth, this, this sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's impossible, it's absurd. Well, it gets actually worse. Here are some real examples that you can see in everyday life from the newspaper and the media. There is an increasing number of people who believe in the relativity of truth. And this is the idea that every individual has his or her own truth. So I have a truth, you have another truth, they have another truth, and they're both equally valid. Other people believe that biology and physicality have absolutely no place in defining their personal identity. So instead, these people believe that their personal identity is totally defined by how they feel. How they feel about themselves, their feelings, is what determines their reality. So from these very little, simple examples, I can provide you more, but I don't, I don't have time for that you can clearly see how our society is rapidly moving away from, from reason and rational thought and straight into total absurdity. So what I want you to understand here is that the answers that the world provides for the how, when, what, and why about our existence and our purpose in life are completely wrong 
because they are based on human reasoning and imaginations. That's what we need to remember. Throughout the ages, Satan has been striving to bring pain, suffering, and a sense of hopelessness and, and, and ultimately destruction to as many people as he can. And the best way to accomplish his evil purpose is to convince people that God does not exist. That's how he's trying to accomplish this agenda. But the scriptures make a very blunt statement in Psalm 14, verse 1, where it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The reality is, and it always has been, that God does exist, and he revealed himself to us through his creation, through his written word, and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, going to our book of Genesis here, which is the subject of our study, the book of Genesis is the beginning of God's written revelation. We know that. The word Genesis, or Genesis for us in Greek, uh, uh, means a point of origin, or it refers to the birth of something or the birth of someone. And therefore, Genesis has been rightly called the, the book of origins. This is where we find the beginning of creation. We have the beginning of life. We have the beginning of man, the beginning of sin, the beginning of salvation. It's, it's, it's the beginning of God's divine revelation. That's what we have right here in front of us. So Genesis is also a historical book, and it was written by Moses. And what does this mean? Why am I saying this to you? Well, because the events that are going to be described from this moment on are not legends. These are not myths. These are not stories that somebody come up with. This is not fictional. All of this is a historical record. All of these are facts. These things indeed happened. So that is very important for, for, for the young people to remember this. This is a historical book that describes how things actually happened. There's nothing fictitious in this book. So Genesis then is the foundation of the Bible. And this verse 1 that we're going to start reading in just a second is the foundation of the book of Genesis. So verse 1 says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Very simple uh, sentence to, to begin with the entire written revelation of God. Jerome said that the scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for a theologian to swim without ever touching the bottom. So Genesis 1.1 proves that Jerome was right about his assessment of the scriptures. This verse that I just read is, is easy to understand, and yet it is very profound and insightful. This verse this verse 1 introduces us to the Creator. It explains the origin of the world, and it's going to tie the work of God in the past to the uh, work of God in the future. So it all starts with God. And since God is a God of order, we must then begin from the very beginning. So we're going to take a, a little dive, a little swim into the deep uh, end of the pool in, uh, in this study. So. Moses begins this verse 1 with the Hebrew word reishit, which means in the beginning. And what is interesting about this word, and the reason I'm telling you this, is because this word is often used in close association with its antonym, that it's arait, which means the end. So these two words are usually put together wherever there you find them. So what this means is that when Moses was writing about the beginning, he was also thinking and writing with the end in mind. So he's talking about a period of time that has a beginning and has an end. That's what he's telling us here. And this is important because then the prophets and the apostles are going to later speak of the end times in terms of the beginning. So quick examples. Later on, we're going to see that Isaiah and John will speak about new heavens and new earth. They're speaking about and uh, the end of a period and the beginning of a new one. So they're thinking about the end based on the beginning. So from the very beginning of creation, Moses is declaring that God is sovereign, that he determines the end from the beginning. Now, this is not stated here, but that's, that's what we get from this, this very short verse. God is sovereign, and he's in charge of everything. Now, 
what beginning is Moses referring to? The beginning of what, you may ask? Well, the answer is this. Moses is describing the beginning of everything. The phrase, the heavens and the earth, is a figure of speech that is used to describe totality. This phrase refers to all things. So Moses is describing the beginning of the universe and everything that is in it. This is the beginning of everything, absolutely everything that exists. So what Moses, Moses is declaring here is that in the beginning, before there was space, before there was matter or time, before there was anything at all, God was already there. So the obvious implication here is that humanity and everything else in the universe has a beginning and an end except from God. God is eternal. God was there from before our beginning. So in the beginning, God is the phrase that we're looking at. And here we need to focus on the word God because the Hebrew word that is used here for God is not Yahweh as you would have expected, but it's Elohim. And something that is important to know here is that this word Elohim that is describing God is also a plural. And it is sometimes used to refer to pagan deities or gods in plural with, with uh, or, um, lowercase g. So there is really no consensus among theologians of why the plural word Elohim was used to describe the one God of the universe. Some theologians think that this Hebrew plural of Elohim was used to indicate honor or, or majesty. All right, like when they say, let us go, it's, it's like the, the, the plural of, um, um, that's, that's what kings refer to, in, to themselves in, in, in the plural. That's what they're alluding to here, but, but I, don't, I don't think so. There are other people like me that believe that Elohim was used here to demonstrate that there is actually plurality, plurality within the Godhead. So let me explain to you how I make this conclusion. I come up with this conclusion because the scriptures show that when Elohim creates, he creates through his word and by his spirit. Now, we don't see that here immediately, but we will see it later on throughout the scriptures. When God is going to, 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 to create, he does it by speaking his word and through his spirit. And later on in this very chapter of Genesis, we're going to see that the spirit of God was hovering over the surface, ready to create. So I take it then as Elohim being an allusion to the Trinity. Now, as I said, there are some people that don't agree with that, but this is what I think. So I, I, I think that might be right. So anyway, God now, of course, is, is, is not only sovereign and eternal, we also see here that he's omniscient, he has always existed, he's eternal, and also he's almighty. Why? Well, because he created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God is the almighty creator of everything that exists, and he created everything out of nothing. Now, let me explain. Here, it's important that we look at the Hebrew verb that is used here for, for uh, to create, which is bara, and this verb means to create. And in the Old Testament, this verb is always associated with divine activity. Bara is always associated with God. So the phrase here, bara Elohim, means God created. So this verb is never, never associated with human activity. That's why I'm telling you this. That's the importance of knowing how this verb is used. Always about God, never about man. So what the verb para indicates is that God alone has the power to create, to create from nothing. And man, us, we merely have the ability to manufacture using materials that already exist. So in essence, what I'm saying is that we are not creative. Men do not create. We manufacture. We use things that exist to transform them in something different. Only God has the power to create. Now, I do need to point out that nothing in the verb vara or any other Hebrew or Greek verb that are used to describe to create indicates that creation occurs or happens out of nothing, or in the Latin, creati creatio ex nihilo. So the idea here is that God created everything out of nothing is deduced exclusively by the context. So let, let me define how, do, how we, we reason this. 
If God existed before there was anything at all, then by necessity, he had to have created everything out of nothing. That's how we arrived to this conclusion that he created everything out of nothing, because there was nothing when he was already there, except for him. Now, before we move to verse 2, I need to talk to you about an idea that has been very popular among very good theologians, solid theologians throughout time, including A.W. Pink, Donald Gray Ironhouse, and our very own Dr. Johnson, who by his own admission, and just for a short time, because he later changed his mind, he believed in what is called the gap theory. And this is the belief that there is a gap of time right here between Genesis 1 and 2. And this theory was proposed in 1814 by a guy, a Scottish, theolo Scottish theologian by the name of Thomas Chalmers. And then this uh, theory was popularized in the United States by the very popular Schofield Study Bible. So what the gap theory suggested is that Genesis 1.1 1, 1, um, describes the universe uh, uh, being created and everything comes to be, and that nature runs its course and, and everything is happening in the earth and in the universe, and, and, and most especially the earth is going through the several different geologic ages uh, that are believed that occurred in the planet. And then, at some point that is unbeknown to us, something catastrophic happened. There was a cataclysm of some sort that destroyed all life on Earth, leaving a massive graveyard behind of fossils and, and, and petrified stuff, and you name it. Everything is dead. Everything is wiped out, gone. So it is speculated that this cataclysm was produced probably by some type of judgment. And some have speculated or suggested that this cataclysm was a result of Satan's rebellion against God and then the aftermath of, of this judgment upon Satan and a third of the angelical being um, is, uh, the result is, is uh, described in Genesis 2 where it says that the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. That's what this uh, gap theory is trying to, to describe. So the main purpose of this theory, the gap theory, was to explain the different the uh, uh, geological ages that were proposed by evolutionary um, geologists. And while there are so many good reasons and, and good arguments in favor of this theory, um, none of them are actually thoroughly convincing. Um, and, and, and this is, of course, the uh, strongest biblical argument against the gap theory that was written by Moses. And this is kind of what turned Dr. Johnson away from this theory into a new direction. Um, and it is found in Moses, in, in uh, Exodus, written by Moses, in Exodus 20, verses 9 through 11, where it says this, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female, or uh, your male or female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. And now the key verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So. These verses, if you, if you listen to them carefully, these verses do not speak about creation and recreation or, or creation and renovation. Moses is clearly declaring here that God created everything in six days and on the seventh he rested. Moses did not say that God created everything on the first day and then six days later he renovated everything that was destroyed during the so-called gap. So it's about what Moses said and not what he didn't say. Now we move on to the first half of verse 2 that says this, the earth was formless and void, or formless and empty, if you have the um, NIV. The Hebrew noun tohu means a wasteland. It is something without form, or in this case, formless. So this noun tohu, refers to a non-productive and uninhabited land. And in some cases, uh, tohu can also uh, mean a, a desert, a desert place, an empty place, a barren place. So what this section is describing 
is the condition of the earth, of the world, before God prepared it for humanity. Moses is telling us here that at this point in time, the world was uninhabitable. It is inhospitable. It is empty. It is not ready to receive human life yet, but it is there. So let me attempt to give you an illustration that will hopefully bring some color um, to what we just read. I'm, I'm, I'm a visual learner. I need, to, I need to think in terms of images. So, so let's pretend that God began by creating this, this massive canvas on which he would later on lay his creation. So the canvas is, is the, the carpet on this room, okay? And then the canvas is ready. This is where creation is going to go. So now, after that, he creates the material that he's going to need to develop this creation. So what is this material? Well, we're, God has to come up with elements, elements that are going to be part of the creation. So I imagine he would have created carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And then some of you might ask, well, why, why those six first? Why not everything else first? Well, the reason I'm saying these six first is because they... Uh, compose 98% of everything that lives and everything there, that there is. So these are the basic elements of everything. So that's why I'm imagining he starts with this. And then after that, that God prepares all these elements that we find in the periodic element of, of um, the periodic table of elements. Now he plays everything in order somewhere. And then everything is there ready so that God can progressively shape everything into being in the next coming days. So, of course, this is by no means a, a, a perfect example, but that, that's how, something that is going to help us envision. He has the canvas and the raw materials, and everything is ready for, for him to begin to shape everything into being. So then, from here, the second half of verse 2 says, And darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So darkness at this point prevailed over the landscape. And then some have suggested that the metaphorical meaning of darkness in this particular point is, is referring to evil, is referring to death. But that is not the case here. In this case, darkness is not necessarily negative because after all, it is God who made darkness as part of his good creation. So darkness was also created by God. And I say this because in Isaiah 45, verse 7, God himself says that he formed the light and created darkness, and he brings prosperity and creates disaster. So God is saying, I also created darkness. So in this particular context, darkness is describing the, that the landscape was lifeless, that it was uninhabited, that it was incomplete. So that's what he's, he's uh, describing. And then he says that the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And this metaphor, for those of you who have read the Bible in its entirety, you might remember that there is a, a similar metaphor in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 11, where God is described as an eagle hovering over the, over the nest of its young, and it's protecting and making their nest fit for them. So, so that's what God is doing. He's hovering over his creation. So what we have here is a first glimpse of a personal God who is intimately, intimately involved with his creation. This verse is showing us how God was hover, uh, overseeing the condition of the earth and preparing the way for his creative work. One detail that I don't want us to miss here is that only the Spirit at this moment, only the spirit is alive and in motion. Everything else, all these elements that I was describing to you, the periodic table of elements, all are, are just there, motionless and lifeless, just waiting for their orders. And God is the only one that is moving. God is the only one that has life and movement. So God is getting ready to accomplish his means by work of the spirit. So I do recognize that I have not answered the questions that many of you might have, whether you're here or listening to this later on. And these questions might be something like, when exactly did this happen, all right? Or where exactly did this happen? 
how exactly did this unfold or how did we get from nothing to everything? Or why did God create everything? These are very, very valid questions. These are common questions, and we have probably all answer, uh, asked those at some point or another. And the truth is that Genesis does not answer any of these questions. The reason for this is that these are not primary questions. That's why we don't get an answer for those. The, these are the wrong questions to ask. The right question to ask is who? Who is the right question? Who made everything that there is? Who is responsible for making everything? That is the question that we need to be concerned about. That is the question that we need to ask. And this is the focus. This is the question that Genesis is answering, is answering the who, which is the most important. So if it is still this not satisfactory, I have, to say, I have to say that to demand an answer from the scriptures when none is given is very dangerous. Because Satan has led many to believe that if people do not get these answers straight, if they don't get these answers from the scriptures, well, they just cannot trust God. And then if you cannot trust God, well, you cannot even, you can also follow his lead. So what is there left to do? You just go your own way. You just follow your own path. The problem is that this path leads to nothing but pain and suffering and ultimately damnation. Because we do not have the power nor the authority to demand anything from God. We cannot demand that he ans asks, answers our questions to our satisfaction. Who are we to do that? We're no one. We, we, we don't have that kind of ability. We don't have that authority. So what we need to remember here is that God revealed to us, according to his sovereign will, and his purpose, what he wanted us to know. He gave the informa information he wanted us to have. He gave us what we needed, not what we want. And you will see this throughout the scriptures, and you see that in your life. God gives us what we need and not necessarily what we want. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. God is the one who reveals. God is the one who withdraws or, or keeps information. That's just what it is. He's sovereign and he's wise. So the focus of verses 1 and 2, of course, is God. And in fact, the entire Bible, the subject of the entire Bible is God himself. So in our lesson today, we learn that matter Time, space, and energy are not eternal, as you might have learned in your science class. These things are not eternal. We learned that life did not happen by mere chance, okay? Because things don't just happen. That is not scientific. Those, has, those things are not repeatable or observable. So to just say that things just popped out out of nothing for no reason at all is not even scientific. It's not rational. So that's what we're seeing here. We saw that everything and everyone has a beginning and an end. Everything, whether it's visible or invisible, was created by the almighty God of the Bible. That's how everything started. That's what we just read. Now listen to what God had to say about himself in Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There is no question that God is the creator, that God is sovereign, that God is eternal, that God is powerful and wise. He says he's himself. So Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, are a clear and stern rebuke to those who believe in polytheism, to those who believe that there are many gods. It is a stern rebuke to atheists who believe that there is no God, to materialists who believe that physical matter has always existed, it is also a rebuke to evolutionists who believe that human life evolved from a primitive source of life, sometime, somewhere. So God and God alone has the power to create. God and God alone has the wisdom to design, the sovereignty to rule, the mercy to nourish his creation, and the infinite loving kindness and grace to save and regenerate sinners who come to him by faith. God is the only one that has this kind of power. 
So, to all my students that are here now, spread it throughout the room, I have to tell you this. Your presuppositions inevitably determine how you, how you make decisions, they determine your opinions, they determine what happened, uh, how do you process everything that happens to you and around you, and the decisions that you make. Your presuppositions will ultimately determine how you live your life. There is no question about that. There is no going around that. Those presuppositions affect almost everything in your life. There is no question. And therefore, if you are here presupposing that there is no God, then it's going to be very easy for all of you to believe that truth is subjective, that evil is relative, that sin is not really offensive, it's actually harmless, and that feelings actually determine the reality of a person, and that hope for the future is completely dependent on your effort and your ability and your intellect. If you believe that there is no God, then you are accountable to no one but yourself. You can do as you please, and as long as nobody knows about this, there will be no consequences. So you're gonna just go wild. Your actions are going to be focused completely and, 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 and entirely on yourself. You will live to please yourself. So let me remind you one more time that Genesis 1.1 says that God made everything. We're going to start with that. And if God made everything, then that means that he made you and he made me and everybody else. And if God made everybody else, he made all of us, then all of us are accountable to the Creator, to the one who made us. So we're accountable to God. And that changes how we live our life. That changes everything. So many of us cringe at the sound of this world accountability. All right? We don't want to be judged. We don't want to be asked, you know, what have we done with X, Y, or Z? But being accountable to God is a very good thing because our God is a good and merciful God and He's gracious and, and He loves His people and He cares for His people. We have seen, we have been in other parts of the Bible. This is not the first time you heard, heard me saying this. And if you have read the scriptures and if you have been at Sunday school and if you have heard the word preached, you know that He is what I am telling you that He is. So. Creation, then, is the beginning of the road that leads to redemption of fallen sinners. The Bible tells us how we are, who we are, and what we must do. But most importantly, the Bible tells us who God is, what He did, and what He promised to do in the future. The Bible is how we know about everything. And most importantly, this is how we know about God. Now... For the parents and the grandparents that are here today, I also brought something for you. I would like you to hear what the Lord has to say about us and His Word in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And it says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That sounds very familiar, right? Continues in verse 6. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk to them, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You shall, not if you have time, all right, whenever it's convenient. No, you will, you must, we must, because I'm also a parent. So why am I telling you this? Well, our children, as you all know, are relentlessly bombarded with messages and information that are all intended to lead them away from God. That's a danger. That immediately needs to perk your ears. Therefore, as parents and grandparents, we, 
we need to make sure that we are the ones discipling our children and that we are the first and main source of instruction or in, of encouragement and correction. Our children are being discipled no matter what. The only, the only question is, are they being discipled by us or by someone else? Because the instruction is happening. Video games, friends, education, culture, media, you name it, everybody is teaching something to our children. Am I part of that mix? That's the real question. That's where we need to focus. And I understand that the Bible is full of difficult concept, concepts and teachings, and yet, these children, our children, need to learn the Bible as a whole, as a whole, so that they can have the certainty that God indeed exists, and they, were, they are able to develop godly presuppositions and a solid biblical worldview. That's what they need to know, everything that there is in the Scriptures, however difficult it might be. They cannot develop a presupposition that God exists, and in, and, and in turn, they cannot have a biblical worldview if they do not know the Scriptures. This is the basis for having a biblical worldview. And if we do not know, if, if we do not know this, we cannot make the right decisions. That's the bottom line. That's, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Now, if you're here without Christ, you need to know that God... God is really who he says he is. God exists whether we believe it or not. God exists whether we accept it or not. God is. He doesn't need our permission or approval. He's not one of the Greek gods that he's diminished uh, the moment people start believing in them. God is, period. So the important presupposition that we must live by is that God is. And he revealed himself through us through his marvelous creation. He revealed himself to us through his magnificent word and through his majestic son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He made himself known. We have no excuse. Everywhere you turn, you see that there is a God, an intelligent creator. We are accountable to him. I just said, if he made all of us, he, he made us, and now we're accountable to him. Now, ignorance of his word is not an excuse. When I came to this country 23 years ago, there might have been some laws that I wasn't aware of, but if I had broken them and got caught, saying, hey, listen, I didn't know about your laws, well, I'm sorry, you're still going you know, to the precinct because ignorance is not, is not a reason to break the law. So in this case, if you don't know, do not know the Lord, that doesn't mean that you're exempt from the penalty. So, if you have not yet trusted Christ for your salvation, there is a high probability that you may not believe in anything that I just said. And I honestly don't blame you, because you have no reason to believe in what I am saying. You don't know me. So why would you believe me? There was a time when I sat in those same chairs and those pews back there listening to Mr. Duncan preach with skepticism and disdain. I mean, that's, that's what it was. So I invite you, if you have not yet come to Christ, to open the Bible and read for yourself and let God speak to your heart directly. Read these words and examine them thoroughly as I did. And then you will see for yourself whether I am preaching the word of life or not. The word of God is powerful, and it will have an effect. It will not come out vo void, I'm sorry. Open the Bible and see for yourself, and may the Lord give you the willingness to do so, and may he bless you with salvation so that you too may worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for who you are, for your mercy of showing to us through your scriptures, through creation, through your son, who you are, for letting us know uh, who we are, most importantly, for rescuing us from our hopeless state of sin through your, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless us as we consider these words, that we would be diligent in teaching our children, be diligent in, in, in feeding ourselves with your word every day so that we may in turn pass this information to other people. 
Lord, we thank you for all the blessings we receive. We, we pray for the state of the world, that if it is your will, that you would bring revival to the land, that we may be able to turn back to you, to the road, to the way that leads to salvation. Lord, use us for that uh, purpose, if that's your will. Bless uh, Dan as he teaches in a few more minutes. Uh, bless us as we go back into the world that is hostile to your word. Uh, give us uh, courage and strength as we face difficulties of life. Allow us to remember your promises and cling to those. In Jesus' name, amen.